Open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. We are continuing in our series through the book of Genesis. And just by way of reminder, um, the first three chapters are going to be slow. They, they have been slow and methodical. And uh, I, I promise you, once we breach beyond the third chapter and once we go into the narrative of, of Cain and Abel and so on and so forth, um, that it will move at a much quicker pace. But as I mentioned all along, uh, these first three chapters in the book of Genesis are just so vital to your faith and to your understanding and to your theology. Um, it's crucial that we understand some of these principles. They're so foundational. Uh, they're so fundamental. Um, just the question of how did we get here? Uh, who made us? All those things are all represented in the first three chapters. The questions of what is marriage? What's God's design and His plan for marriage are all in the first three chapters. What's God's design for human sexuality? All in the first three chapters. Um, what is the human condition? What, why is there sin? All of these things uh, are in the first three chapters. And they set the pace, they set the standard for what's in the rest of the Bible. It's really hard to understand um, the atonement of Jesus Christ on the cross if you don't understand the fall of man, if you don't understand our condition of sin, if you don't understand original sin. And so for that reason, we're taking this uh, at a snail's pace. We're taking a look at things in detail. In fact, to be quite honest with you, we could probably spend a whole year in the first three chapters of Genesis. There are so many uh, different uh, weaving theological principles that are within. In fact, um, to be perfectly honest, as a pastor, it's been really, really hard to just kind of key in on, on one or two themes. There's just so much happening. Um, but I have resisted the urge to spend uh, three months in, in one verse, and we're, we're moving along anyway. But the point that we're at here in uh, Genesis chapter 3 is, of course, um, the deception of Satan came, and woman was deceived to eat from the tree, and, and man was uh, passive in his leadership in the garden, not only allowing his wife to fall, uh, but also falling along with her, taking and eating as well. And we found last week that one of the very first responses to sin is that we, we try to hide that sin. We saw in the garden that Adam and Eve, they noticed that they were naked after they ate from the forbidden fruit. And the very first thing they did is they sewed together fake leaves to hide their nakedness. Because suddenly they realized um, there is evil that can be involved with nakedness. They realized the potential of sin. And the very first thing that they did is that they hid their sin. And we looked and we cross-examined ourselves against this response from Adam and Eve. And we found that um, most of us kind of do the same thing. Even here today, even all these thousands of years removed from the garden, man hasn't changed much. When we sin, one of the first things we try and do is we try and hide it. Um, so this is the, uh, the man who is looking at pornography, who after looking at pornography immediately goes to the history and deletes it. This is the adulterous uh, wife who is deleting all of her texts. This is the alcoholic who hides their liquor. Um, we, we have all experienced some kind of, of level of this. Uh, when immediately we know that we're guilty and we've done something wrong, our first thing is we try and first hide it. And we're going to look at, over the next couple of weeks, um, some other ways that we respond to our sin. This week, we're going to look at how we not only hide our sin, but we also try and hide from God as well. And then next week, we're going to look at how, as a response to our sin, um, Hi, Carter. <laughs> Were you waving at me or her? Okay. All of a sudden I see Carter waving. <laughs> I get distracted easy. Uh, but we're going to look at how, as a response to our sin, another thing we do is that we pass the blame. We, we don't want to accept blame. Um, and that's really that's going to be a really good one next week because I, I feel strongly that that is a big problem that we have, especially in this culture, even among Christians, is just... The inability to accept responsibility for what we've done 
um, and, and the, uh, the tendency to pass it along, pass along the blame to other people. So I think that would be a really good one. But for, for today, we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 11, and we're going to see how we hide from God. So let's look. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. And they, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? So I want you to notice in this section, after the deliberate, conscious decision to sin against God, Adam and Eve not only tried to hide their sin with a fig leaf, but they also tried to hide from God within the thicket of the trees. And looking at us today and our behavior today, I believe we do the exact same thing. Um, I think there is a contrast, however, between those who don't have a, a desire for God, those who don't treasure God and love God, you know, maybe they uh, wistfully acknowledge Him, but they don't really have a commitment to Him. Um, those who even curse God, hate God, the idea of God. Um, there is a distinction between that group of people and those who, like us, love the Lord, uh, honor the Lord, cherish Him, cherish His words, want to follow Him, want to do the best we can. Um, the unbeliever in sin, in their hardness of heart, in their seared conscience, typically does not have any shame. Not because they uh, should have shame, um, but because they convince themselves of what they're doing is good. They make their own standard of righteousness. They ignore God's standard of righteousness. And so therefore, when they're living in their sin, um, when they get to the point of a hardened heart and a seared conscience, it, it doesn't really matter. They don't need to hide from God. In fact, you could even say uh, they have a lot of pride about their sin. They might even throw a parade and call it a pride parade. Who knows? They'll, they'll wave their flag of sin right in your face. They'll expect you not only to accept their sin, but also to, um, to honor their sin. And um, we're not talking about just one specific sin. This is all sin. And we look at Romans chapter 1, verse 32. This is the process of depravity of the hardened heart. It says, Though they know God's righteous decree, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. And so there needs to be a distinction made. When a sinner with a hardened heart sins, they don't really acknowledge the fact that they're sinning. And so they don't really feel the need to hide. They're happy doing it out in the open. But for the believer, however, and in the case of Adam and Eve, who walked with the Lord in the garden, they talked with the Lord in the garden, they had a relationship with God, obviously they believed in God, um, their response after the sin is that they hid. And I think that we do the exact same thing. Don't we? we hide because we're ashamed. Because we know that it's wrong. You know, a majority of the time when we sin, we know that it's wrong. We've heard the sermons, we've read the scriptures that tell us that it's wrong. And so our immediate thought is shame. We don't want to face up to our loving God, the God who has done so much for us. And so we tend to hide. Adam and Eve hid in the thicket of trees, and I think today there's two <coughs> primary ways that we hide from God today. Number one, we pull away or we stop attending church. And when I say church, I mean public assembly, coming together the way that we are now in public assembly, praising Him, worshiping the song, and uh, studying the scriptures together, talking with one another, sharing, confessing, all that kind of stuff. We pull away from God. And I believe that we do this um, out of shame. I believe we do this because we don't want to face God about our failures. And I think there is a, a big problem with that kind of mindset. Um, I think in the church today, and many of us, we feel like we can only really come to church and worship God and study His Word when we got it all together. And, and I think that there's just a, a big problem with that. I think that's the wrong perception of what 
church is meant to be. Church is not meant to be a bunch of people who've got it all figured out, perfect people, coming together to worship God. Uh, the idea of church is that we are all sinners. We are all sinners saved by grace. We are all failures, um, and we need the Lord to help us overcome our problems. And we need each other to help us overcome our problems. Amen. And so rather than coming together as some self-righteous club or people who put on these masks to say that I got it all figured out, I'm doing good, and I haven't sinned at all, um, rather than a club like that, we ought to be a club of misfits, a club that is spurring each other along, trying to figure it out together. But the opposite tends to happen. Uh, maybe we view our church as a self-righteous club. Maybe we don't view it as a place that's comfortable to come and just say, you know what, I'm really struggling here and I need help. Uh, and that's a tragedy because that's what the church is meant to be. And so when we sin, we don't want to come to church. We don't want to you know, hear the sermon and, and maybe feel convicted. Uh, we don't want people to know that we're a failure. That might happen. The second way that we hide from God today is that we all together avoid fellowship with other believers. And by other believers specifically, I mean those who hold to the same uh, standards that we do according to the scripture. Uh, we tend to back away. In fact, sometimes we'll even um, partner up with those of the world, you know, in the workplace, people who won't necessarily confront us about our sin, you know, those who might even sin in the same way. And that's a tragedy as well, because we know that um, bad company corrupts good character. We know that you're, you're essentially who you are, you are, who you hang out with, essentially. And so the more Christians you hang out with, the more you're going to be iron sharpening iron, you're going to be encouraging each other, even correcting and rebuking and training out of love with one another. But when we, are, when we fellowship with the world, then there isn't any kind of accountability. In fact, there's this uh, Romans chapter 1 process that happens. They not only approve of the, their sin, but um, they'll do it with you. They'll sin with you. They'll spur you on and say, oh, it's okay. But there's something that happens where we just feel like we need to run from God, like we need to hide from Him and, and hide from His principles. But as much as we might try to hide from Him and pull away, um, either by leaving public assembly or the fellowship of believers, the simple fact is that we cannot hide from God. Uh, in the thicket of a tree, or staying at home on Sunday morning. We cannot hide from God. There is no escaping God who is all-knowing. Multiple scriptures attest to the omniscience and omnipresence of God. And uh, I've asked Richard Eden if he would read for us Psalm 139, 1-12, which explains the omniscience of God perfectly. O oh Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. And Job 28, 24 also says, for he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. Jeremiah 23, 23 says, Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. And Hebrews 4, 13, 
No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And the fact is, my friends, in the very end of the final trumpet, uh, when we all stand at the final judgment before our Lord and Savior, every single person in history, standing, believer, non-believer, standing before God, all of our righteous deeds, all of our sinful deeds, laid bare. And the way that you can think about this is uh, God has a filing cabinet, uh, a really big filing cabinet, and in that filing cabinet he has each one of our names. In fact, uh, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, tells us that there's a record containing all of our deeds. And I believe these will all be pulled out in the final day, and he'll have all of our files, and he'll lay them down and separate them. And then after he does that, he's going to open up the Lamb's Book of Life, which has the names of those who have believed in him for eternal life. And when he reads your name, he's going to walk over to your file. Everything you've done, whether public or secret, I believe everybody's probably going to go to the grave with some secret that either one or nobody knows about. But that secret is going to be laid there. And if the Lamb, if your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, he's going to take that file, everything in it, and he's going to throw it into the fire. Forgotten. Forgiven. And it, it's so much so that even now, in the past tense, God says that your sins have been forgiven. That they have been forgotten. Even now in the past tense. Because God operates in that way. Because when he says it is so, it's as if it were past tense. And so when we stand in judgment, we can have the utmost confidence <coughs> that what we've done has been forgiven. And so that brings me, to, brings me to the question. If God is going to forgive those who seek him for his grace and his mercy, why in the world would we then run from him? We should be running to him, to the king of grace and glory. If he can forgive our sins, we should not be hiding from the one who can. That's foolishness. And when we think about the fact that, that God sees all that we do, don't think of him as some kind of a micromanaging dictator, somebody who is just always watching. Uh, you know, when I worked at Best Buy, um, things got so bad as far as uh, financially that they began to just micromanage in every area of the store. When I first worked there, we were doing well, so we had a lot of freedom, a lot of liberty. And then um, once things got bad, they just they tightened that noose around our neck. And one of the things that they would do is um, managers started getting up on those ladders. You know the ladders to go up and get the up stock, you know, to pull things down? They, they positioned those in such a way in the store where they could go up to the top and they could watch you. And not only that, but they implemented uh, radios for everybody to wear so that when they were up there watching you and monitoring, uh, if you stopped for even a slight moment um, just to talk to a fellow associate or anything, immediately over the radio you'd hear, Hey, you need to go over there and help this person. Or, hey, you need to go clean the floor. They were, they were optimizing and maximizing the work production. But the way they did that was in a way where they were just watching you at all hours. Um, <laughs> but God's not that way. Even though God is all-knowing, all-perceiving, he is uh, in all places, God is not that way. We're not to think of him as a micromanaging manager sitting on top of the stairs and directing you everywhere you go. We're to think of him as a constant gardener, uh, one who is constantly walking through the garden, uh, pruning and cutting and taking care of his garden. Why? Because he, he loves his garden. We are his garden. He is the constant gardener. John chapter 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. 
I want you to notice here that as he approaches Adam and Eve, even though he is omniscient, omnipresent, he, he still asks them these questions. Where are you? When he asked that question, he, he knew exactly where they were. Uh, when he asked, well, you know, why, why did you cover yourself up? Who, who told you that you were naked? He knew the answer to that. But why would he do that? Ask yourself, parents, especially those of you who have been parents or grandparents. Um, when you found out, without a shadow of a doubt, that your child did something naughty, but they didn't know that you knew, Okay, what did you do with that information? Did you use that on occasion to test whether they would lie to you or not? To test their character, to see where they're at? Because as parents, after all, it's our job to prepare them for the world. We don't want them to be liars. So if, if they're going to develop a character of lying, then that's a way to test them. I can think of a couple of situations with my kids where that's been the case. And even early alone. And I've asked them, Sophia, did you take the cookies you weren't supposed to take this morning? And uh, I'm not on mission, I'm not omnipresent, but the crumbs in her bed <laughs> are kind of evidence that she was guilty of it. And I, I remember, um, I, was, I was disappointed. She, she lied. She said no. No. And I knew that she lied. And rather than calling her out right away and saying, you're a liar, don't lie to daddy, I, I gave her some more opportunity. I said, well, what about the crumbs here in your bed? Um, you know, where, where did these come from? I don't know. <laughs> and then, you know, you give them even more opportunity. Well, was it Sienna? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Eventually, I, I told her that what she did was wrong. Eventually, I said, Sophia, I know you're lying. And eventually, she admitted it. But it, it was a learning lesson for her, and it was uh, valuable for me as well for our relationship. Because now, I, I can see her tells when she's lying. Uh, it's like a poker player, you know? It, it was, that was valuable information to me. Um, I know her behaviors now when she lies. And she knows that a lot of times, daddy is going to know. So it's better to tell the truth. And so we look at this situation in the garden with God. God is, that's why he's called Abba. That's why he's called our father. Because he very much loves us and treats us like he's our father. He knew very well what Adam and Eve did. And he wanted to give them every opportunity to come clean. He wanted to test their loyalty, test their honesty. And I want you to notice that Adam doesn't come clean with it right away. Um, he says, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. That's not the truth. He hid himself because they ate from the fruit they weren't supposed to. And they were feeling dirty and naughty. That was the reason. So even though they're telling them partial truths, they're not telling them complete truths. And God knows that. I want you, I want you to notice the love of God. The love of God lets them squirm for a little while. That's a loving thing. It's a loving thing to let people you love squirm for a little while. And uh, God does that here. I don't think it's a bad thing for parents to do that either. It's a valuable lesson to learn. And so God lets them squirm. And he may persuade our repentance, but he will never force us to repent. He wants to give us every available opportunity to come clean on our own, to make that decision on our own. Just in the same way that we make the decision to sin, he wants to give us the freedom and the ability to make the decision to repent. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he'll let us squirm. That's because he loves us. If he didn't love us, he would have immediately struck them dead without explanation. He would have said, okay, you sinned, I said you're going to die, you're dead. That's it. If God did not love us, that's what he would have done. Because he loves us, he used this as an opportunity to help us learn and to grow for all time. God is a good father. God knows that each and every one of us are sinners. God knows our secrets. He knows our secret sins, our public sins. He knows everything about us. 
And so I submit to you, it is foolishness to run from him when we do so. Rather, we should run to his throne of grace. Because it's at his throne of grace that we can be forgiven. It's at his throne of grace where he can, he can nourish us and encourage us and spur us along and help us overcome these problems. Help us overcome these addictions. And when we try and hide from God by not coming to church and, and not having fellowship with other believers, then that's the same as going and hiding in the thicket of the woods. And I pray and I hope that as a church that we can develop such a community here that people would feel comfortable to do that. Uh, that people would know that they could come, that there's a trusted person somewhere here, either in, in leadership or just a friend that comes here, that they can sit down with and say, I, I've got to get this off my chest. I, I, I need to confess to you, because James says to confess. And I need you to pray with me. And I need you to be an accountability partner. Because, man, that fruit looks so good sometimes. And I, I know the consequence, but, man, sometimes that, just that desire for that fruit is just so strong. And I need help. I need help. It's not weakness to ask for help. In fact, quite the contrary. I, I'd say that's strength. It's strength to be able to ask for help. So I'd like to ask Naomi to come back up. And I want to encourage you. If you need a fresh start this morning, if, if there's been things that you've just been failing at, or things deep in your past, and you just feel like you need a fresh start, I'm here to tell you that Jesus gives us a fresh start. Wherever you're at, whatever time of day, whatever you're doing, uh, right now, uh, a week from now, whatever. That's the, that's the beauty of Jesus Christ, is he allows you to hit that reset button and try it again. There's no penalty for that, okay, Lord? I just need to try again. I failed this time. Or to take a mulligan. There's no shame in that. Okay, this is not tournament play golf. This is, this is backyard golf, okay? Life with God is backyard golf. He says, you want to take a mulligan? Okay, go ahead and try that again. Okay, you, you want to take a drop and not have it count against you? That, that's fine. Let's, let's do that. Um, being a, a gamer, as you, as you all know, um, sometimes it's just nice just to hit that reset button and start from the beginning. Uh, maybe you have OCD like that as well. You start a project, it's not going very well, you're just not very happy with it, uh, you, you didn't do the right things with it, and you just want to abolish it and just start over. The beauty of a relationship with Jesus Christ is He gives you that opportunity every time. No matter how bad you feel, where you can just say, God, I want to hit that reason. So, what I want to ask you today, is if that's you, if you need to just reset this morning, I want to give you permission to do that. For all of us, and whether we know your sins or not, to be forgotten and forgiven. Because if you believe in Jesus, they are. And he will burn those files in the last day. So let's just reset today, okay? Let's just forget the failures of this last week. Let's try again this week, okay? Why don't you join me this